This is Megan recording for podcast number 7, recorded at 9.15 p.m. on the 5th of February, 2013. This is take number 3, people. I hope this does not get flopped. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? This is Megan, as always, doing podcast number 7. Today's subject is Asperger's and communication. I think we're going to slide a little bit of just general learning in there. And I know a lot of you know that I have Asperger's. Some of you don't, and that's okay. I'm not expecting some sympathies, and I'm not expecting some empathies. I mean, I, I, I guess I kind of expect both. I don't expect either one, really. I really don't expect either. I thought about having both, but then I'm like, uh, no, that's pitiful. But I am here to talk about some personal things that have occurred in my life that I've come to realize involving Asperger's communication and just learning in general. And what I want to talk about involves the way that people perceive autism slash Asperger's as well as the learning process that might entail regardless of whether you have the spectrum or a different kind of disorder or not. I must give a very big asterisk because I warn you all that this is based off my own experiences so I can't stand up and say this is what Asperger's people think and this is what the autism community thinks. I can't speak for all of you because everyone goes through autism differently. I think it's really silly when people assume that everyone who's autistic flaps their arms. I think it's really silly when people assume that everyone spins. And I think it's really annoying when everyone assumes that autistic and Asperger people are nerds. Which is a really annoying one. I'm a nerd, but I consider them two separate things. Asperger's and nerds are two totally different things in my mind. And I don't understand why people keep putting them together. (laughs) Why? I don't get it. Anyway, so... Now that that little asterisk is out of the way, then I do believe I can perpetually... Perpetually? Is that a word? Yeah, that's a word. I just don't know what that meant. I can give you perspective. There we go. I can give you perspective on what exactly happens in my head in terms of communication and language. Starting with this. I don't understand sarcasm. Sometimes. Air quote, sometimes. Why is this? I don't know fully. There are times where a person will say something sarcastically, and I'll look at them and go, seriously? And everyone will laugh. And I don't mean seriously sarcastic either. I'm serious. Really? Like, I'm emphasizing on the fact that Something said is not sarcasm. I'm not being stupid. I just don't hear it. I'm not deaf. I'm not tone deaf. Can't say worth a damn, but that's not the point. The problem that a lot of people who have Asperger's, or anybody who has a non-neurotypical disorder, is that sometimes there's a certain thing you can't hear. I'm not talking about necessarily tone deaf. In my communications class at my campus, they talk about briefly about the hints to sarcasm. Because sometimes we don't necessarily, even in the neurotypical world, hear that someone's being sarcastic. Sometimes it's just completely blank to them too, but that's really rare. And that's just because they weren't paying attention or it just briefly went over their heads. So when a person says something sarcastic, there's a good percent of us, regardless of whether you're on the spectrum or not, that doesn't actually pick up that it's sarcasm. Now, some of the traits that they talk about is the rate of speech. You know, how fast are they talking? Is there a raise in tone that that wasn't expected and it's clumped? Are they raising their voice? Are they giving a certain look to their face? Does it seem too out of place and too big? 
The problem with asking these questions to a person with Asperger's is that you're probably going to find these kind of answers. A person will say, did I raise my voice? I, I guess. Did you notice that I gave a really funny face? Yeah. Did you notice that I changed my tone? I suddenly sound really, really suave. Yeah. Okay. Why couldn't you tell if I was sarcastic? Because I seriously thought you could fit 20 beavers in a boat. Depends on the size of the boat, dude. There's half your problem right there. It's unfortunate because when we get to that last question, sometimes, for me, personally, me, this is me here talking, I hear something that sounds sarcastic to others, but I wonder if it's actually possible. Like, every man in the world will hump every woman they see. That's actually too abstract for me to understand, but I know if I was younger, I would have been like, why is that? And they'll laugh, and I'm like, what? And I'm, they'll be like, oh, I was just being sarcastic. And I was like, uh, oh. Okay. I heard that it sounded like it was sarcastic, but the message itself said otherwise. This is the problem that people who are not of the spectrum have with those who are on the spectrum. Step one to learning. Finding out where exactly is the problem that the person needs air quote, corrected. Maybe it's the tone of the voice. Maybe it's the content itself. Maybe it's the pitch. Maybe it's the fact that they just straight up can't connect to the fact that it's sarcasm. You can explain that there was a high pitch. Did you notice that my pitch raised? Pitch. I know the definition of it. I just can't tell. What do you mean by pitch? And they're not even tone deaf either. They just can't connect to the word. They just can't connect. Maybe that's not the case at all. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it has something to do with some other thing. Maybe they are tone deaf. Maybe they have face blindness, which can be a big problem for some people. And please do correct me in the comments below if this is incorrect. Because if I'm not mistaken, face blindness is when you look at two different people and you can't tell that they are two different people. I can't think of the anime right now. It was like a 12 episode anime. But he was a human sword. <laughs> and he lived on this deserted island because his father was banished. And the only thing we know, spoiler alert, is that... Katana Gatari. That's the anime. Katana Gatari. Spoiler alert. Is that he kills his father. Spoiler alert over. But, towards the second episode, in the ep second episode, I believe it is the second episode, he looks at everyone and he can't tell who's who. That's face blindness. So actually what his partner does is that she lets him feel her hair. He lets, him, he lets her lick her, which is really weird. The anime is weird. That's for a different day. But to study her. I'll let you study today. What that is, is him getting to know and feel and look at her and taste her and l study and feel and see and look for details because the brain didn't instinctively know because he'd only had known two other people, his sister and his father. So he didn't know. Now, I guess in a way that could be applied to Asperger's because that's instinctive. They've seen so many people but yet they still have face blindness where they can't tell who's who. Still, step one still applies. You have to find what exactly is the issue and where the problem resides that you're trying to correct. Air quote correct. So, if it is, let's say, let's say they're connection with the understanding of raised, raised voice. Maybe they have a hard time recognizing a raised voice. Step two is understanding how difficult they're having that problem with. I tend to have problems with vocabulary and tense. Past tense, present tense, current tense, future tense. When I'm writing, 
but when I'm speaking, it's not a problem with tenses. In fact, I'm, I'm fine when I speak. Writing is horrible. And that, that's why everyone, no matter who you are in the writing world, always advises, make sure you read out loud your rough draft. Because you will regret it if you don't. You will strongly regret it if you don't. And you will hate yourself for it. I catch spelling, half sentences, most commonly tenses. Worst part about that is that most Microsoft Office programs will not catch tense errors. As well as misspelling errors like there, there, and there. And thankfully, I actually know the damn difference. <sighs> Come on, people. T-H-E-R-E -E is here and there. The word here is in the word there. T-H-E-I-R, we'll skip that for a second, because T-H-E-Y apostrophe R-E is an abbreviation for they are. So if it doesn't fit those two, it's ownership. T-H-E-I-R. How hard is that to figure out? You're in your Y-O-U-R, ownership. Y-O-U apostrophe R-E, you are. If it doesn't work if you say you are, it's ownership. Y-O-U-R. It's an it's. I-T-S, ownership. I-T apostrophe S, it is. What is so hard for people to understand this? <laughs> I, don't, I don't get it. Anyway, moving on. The level of how hard it is for me to understand tenses doesn't go to vocabulary in me speaking. But it goes into writing. If a person was to teach me tenses and they had me speak it, they would misunderstand me for having understand tenses while writing and thus would skip over it. Knowing the depth of the problem will help you a lot. Knowing the depth of how difficult, of what exactly pinpointing, going that extra distance and seeing where the problem resides within that main subject will help you. If the problem is communication, if Y is communication and X is the fact that you don't understand whether someone's laughing at you or laughing with you, but that X is also the fact that you can't understand tone or pitch, then you know where your target is. You've found that X and the Y. Now where's the Z applied? The Z is how hard a person or how easy a person learns. For some reason, this is a problem. For some reason, People don't understand that people learn at different speeds. Some people, especially in the spectrum, learn very quickly on one specific subject, and it's always a subject they don't have a problem with. They learn that like there's no tomorrow. Give them a subject they know nothing about, and you're going to be sitting there for 20 hours still with nothing done. So you got your X, you got your Y, you got your Z. Doesn't mean you're going to get it done in an efficient manner, but it sure it helps, and helps narrow it down, don't it? I wish people did this more often. Nobody does, and it's agitating. Now, for me personally, I always felt like as if the inability to properly portray my message has been a problem since I was little. I still see this to this day, even with neurotypicals. A student will ask a question in class, and the teacher will answer it in the most roundabout way. And I'm thinking to myself, that's not what he asked. And this happened one time in a um, Microsoft Office class. I said, um, I'm catching myself. I'm getting better at this. Microsoft Office class where they went through everything from Excel to PowerPoint to Word. Everything. Everything. And we had to do a presentation and use, what do you know it, PowerPoint. By the way, if... A student is a visual learner use PowerPoint what is so hard about people using PowerPoint do it what is so hard about that but the students got the chance to ask the presenter questions about their subject and one of them was this girl who was doing a presentation about assistant dogs dogs who do things for disabled or for safety or for whatnot so guard dogs dogs for handicap, whether physical or sometimes mental. They actually do have dogs for the mentally handicapped. Um, side note, if you have a child with autism, 
get them around animals. Get them around dogs and cats. It'll actually help a lot. Um, and side note. Um, there I said um again. The student was done, and they asked, you know, does anybody have any questions? And this older gentleman asked, you know, what other things can these dogs do other than go out on a cold winter mountain? And mind you, this question wasn't said this openly and broadly. Not broadly, but detailed. But they were asking what other, like, services do these dogs do? And she made the most roundabout answer that didn't answer the question. You know, she just basically reset everything she just presented. I was like, really? He asked what other services do service dogs do? You know, they can be guards, they can be rescue dogs, they can be handicapped dogs. Are there other things that dogs can do to help humans? For some reason, she never answered that question correctly. And this is coming from a neurotypical human being. Think of that only all the time. <laughs> that is an Aspie and an autistic at times, if not all the time. And for me, it happens a good 40% of the time where I'm not answering the correct thing because I couldn't catch on to what you were asking. And it's not because I didn't understand the sentence. I broke it down. I analyzed everything. But apparently, I was still wrong. <laughs> I hate that. It's like my biggest weakness is realizing that I answered the wrong question. I kind of had a moment like that when I was at um OhioCon two years ago. We did a D and D panel, um, which is basically an event. If you've never been to a convention, the convention was called OhioCon, and one of the people who's new didn't know how to make a character. And I went on this like philosophical thing about using traits that you have of yourself and creating a character based off of yourself by picking a tiny detail or maybe there's something you've never done before and you want to play with that. And I just went on this like t five straight minute talk philosophically talking about characters. And then she asked, well, what about numbers? And I was like, why didn't you stop me? <laughs> I was on the wrong path! And then my, like, co-panelists were like, because you were doing such a good job, we didn't want to interrupt you. <laughs> oh my god. I felt so proud of myself. And so stupid at the same time. But. Still. My apologies, I'm eating some ice cream. It's all melted. I don't care. It's all melted. But anyway. So even after we have been given this three-part learning process, the X, the Y, and the Z, the subject, the depth of how difficult the subject is, and the learning process that it takes for a person to gain information, why do we have this issue of still teaching people certain ideas? Take, for example, me. I don't always know when somebody's laughing at me or laughing with me. I have this theory that some of us who are on the spectrum don't have a specific type of instinct. And I apologize if that's offensive. You have every right to bash me for it. But that's in my own personal experience with Asperger's. If it applies to you and you understand and it's like an epiphany for you and it's a positive epiphany, good. If not, my apologies. But I always felt that this three set rule of learning and teaching somebody of a communication issue or any issue for that matter is that if you don't have the instinct you won't know to do it for example like earlier I think I gave the example of a yeah I did give the example I gave the example of if a person is laughing at you because you said something and you nudge a person and you're like, hey, why is this funny? The fact that you're asking is proof enough that either A, you just totally missed something, or B, you didn't have the instinct of realizing of being able to reflect back and realize that something is embarrassing. And here's the thing about that. There have been times where somebody will look at me and go, you want to know how it's embarrassing? Ask yourself, is that embarrassing if you were to do that? No. And they'll get pissed. They'll get angry. Take, for example, if um, 
let's say if I wanted to say something a certain way and they laugh and I'm like, but how do I know that was funny? And they'll be like, well, say it again. Say it like as if you're saying it to yourself. And I did. Now, isn't that funny? No. The logic, the instinct is either not there, broken, or not working, not broken slash not working correctly. It's either missing, broken, or turned off. And this is my big theory also on Asperger's in general. The way the DNA is turned on and off in the brain and how it reacts and causes the brain to think is that if it's either missing, broken, or turned off. I don't think it's missing. So it's either broken or turned off. If you ask yourself, do you think it's funny, and you don't laugh, but everyone else is, you might want to look into it. But that instinct, that knowledge, that logic, is a little bit tethered and a little bit broken for some people. I remember my grandpa asking me, wouldn't you think it's funny if somebody did that to you? And I'm like, I don't know. It'd be kind of random and depend on the situation. Sometimes I'd find that funny and sometimes I wouldn't. I don't know. Probably no. It solved nothing, didn't it? It's interesting how you can take something like that and just flip it on its head. Because a normal neurotypical person would be able by theory, to take a statement that sounded funny to them and have them repeat it back to themselves and think about it, they'd get it. For a non-neurotypical person, they'll say something, they'll be told to say it back, and they don't get it. It's not that they're stupid, okay? It's not that they're unintellectual. It's just that their logic is different. They'll get it, but they won't find it funny. Or when it's backwards, which is when it's really weird, is when you say something, nobody laughs, but you're cracking up laughing. Because your logic is different. And I don't even know if that's an Asperger trait or not. I really don't know. I'm assuming that's a communication issue. But I don't truly think it is. So what do you do with that information now that you have gained that information and knowing? Well, you can rest on it and truly think of a way to work around that. I don't think people who work with people who have Asperger's fully understand what they're getting their fingers into. And they end up getting their fingers into a blueberry pie when they wanted to get into an apple one. And when they pull their thumb out and wonder why there's purple dye on their fingers, gee, I wonder why. Yes. Blueberries are purple. Not blue. <laughs> I've, I've seen purple blueberries. I think that's their natural color. I don't think there's actually a blue berry. Not that I'm aware of. I don't think so. So, with that analyzed, what can we take from this? Well, in personal experience of learning as an Aspie, most people get step one. A good amount of people will get step two. And then everyone will miss step three. They'll get the X, they'll get the Y, and they'll miss the Z. Oh, we have the problem and we know how far it is? We got this! No, you don't. <laughs> what really annoys me is when one Aspie can pick up on things. They actually learn rather quickly and they can pick up on things. And then there's another Aspie who is so slow. Like she doesn't, he or she doesn't get it. And then they're just supposed to be like, oh, well, there's no hope for her because she's too slow at learning. No, <laughs> you just need more time, which is something you just don't want to do. You don't want to take the time to actually work one-on-one -on -one with an Aspie. Why? Because they're alien to you and you don't like it. Because you don't understand it. It's a really weird thing, because if you don't understand something, you fear it. Quite frankly, it depends on what exactly I don't know. 
I mean, let's think about it. If I saw an alien, and I didn't know it, but it took interest in, like, video games, I'd be like, all bored, kids! <laughs> let's do this! If you find an alien who's holding this strange device that allows you to see into people's heads and display imagery that we would normally have to have this massive machine to do, and he's able to kill people with it, too. I don't know death. Yeah, I'm gonna be scared. <laughs> but I still don't know the alien. It's the alien! We're all scared of it! No. Don't, don't, don't fear it. Don't, don't be afraid of it. Welcome it with open arms and give it cupcakes! <laughs> and hope to God it doesn't die because sugar is its poison. Um... <laughs> So, in recap, for me, in personal retrospective communication, and I'm actually going to go past the half hour mark because I actually want to elaborate more on this because really the first half was just us talking about learning in general. But you think that if you took this equation X, Y, and Z, and applied it to a neurotypical and a non-neurotypical, they would get the same result. It doesn't work that way. I think communication comes of a lack of instinct. And I keep using the word instinct, because whatever, what other thing do you use? You know, primal instinct. But when, when you try to explain this to somebody, and you try to tell them that you don't have the instinct, I've had people shake their heads at me. They go, yeah, you know how to do it. I'm sorry, you don't live in my head. You don't have any right to say that. And it's annoying when people do, because they think they do. They think they have the right to walk up to you and go, you totally have nothing wrong with you. I don't know whether to take that as an insult or a compliment. You know there's something wrong. It's like being told by a doctor that you have cancer. And then being told by somebody else, like a friend or a an acquaintance, that you don't look sick. How do you take that? You know, most people would probably take that complimentary that, oh my god, I haven't lost any hair. They think I'm so pretty even though I'm sick. But at the same time, what do you mean I don't look sick? Of course I'm not going to look sick. I have cancer. You can't see that. You can't see that somebody has cancer. You don't have that knowing in your head that somebody has this without being told unless they lacked hair. Which, I know that that part of the, the disease doesn't really have a reflection or a comparative in Asperger's. Unless you're like severely autistic to the point to where you're nonverbal and can't speak, which even then is confusing because there are people who are just straight up nonverbal. It's really annoying when people look at you and you're like, Oh, you're nonverbal. You must be this way. No, shut up. Quit stereotyping. So you're a parent that has a child or an adult or you yourself have Asperger's or autism and the inability to communicate. Even after this half hour talk about learning how a, what the best strategy is to go about teaching someone something, you still can't get across. Might I suggest that you go to your local school or your campus and take a speech class? I know a lot of you just shrieked in pain and totally hid in the corner. Here's the funny thing about me. When I was little, I hated talking in front of people. But it was a love-hate relationship. I loved it, but I was scared to death. I loved the day when we all got together and make something and presented it. I thought it was the most fun thing in the world. I made a seven minute rant on my other channel talking about otaku realizations and about how I realized as I was getting older that I was doing the one thing I had always known how to do and that was present. Information, whatever, whatnot. And I learned that I want to maybe potentially go into TV and radio, ironically. And it was funny because a lot of my friends are like, but you're an Aspie. You, you actually have communication issues. And I'm like, yeah, isn't it ironic? <laughs> because the funny thing is they actually find that I'm enjoying this and I really do 
want to learn to do this properly. But for those who don't do that and don't really want to go into a field like that, maybe they just want to be an author or maybe an artist, I'm sorry guys, but you still have to communicate. You can always have somebody talk for you on your behalf. Or, if you are able to speak, and this is assuming you can talk, because there are some autistic people who are nonverbal, and for that, I apologize. Because that sucks, <laughs> not being able to speak back, and not being able to portray words correctly. And I'm sorry if this is offensive to you, because I don't know how to solve that problem if you have a social interaction issue, along with the fact that you can't communicate properly through words, hopefully you can at least type, write, or sign language, because then at least you have something. But, if you do have the ability to speak, then do take note, because if you go through one communications class, or one speaking and listening class, or even take a culture class. Take a culture class. Turn in your paper saying you have Asperger's and need special needs. Special help if you need to. If not, disregard that step. And take a speech class. I know, that sounds really scary. <laughs> I know. It's like, oh my god, I'm talking in front of a bunch of, like, scary people. I highly recommend, if you want to learn the details and the somewhat basics of how com conversation occurs and vocabulary occurs and you understand basic English enough that you are fluent like me or at least halfway fluent like me take a communication class I'm not kidding take a communication class you will not regret it if all else fails and you don't like it drop the class it's not going to hurt you. I am currently in my communications class right now. I have a couple problems with my teacher, but in the end, I really don't mind the class at all. We have two presentations, one I will do myself and one I will do in a group. I'm not looking forward to the group presentation, though I am looking forward to the single presentation, just myself. It's ironic that I love doing something that I am weak in so much. And yet, I find it rather relaxing being able to present information to people and attempt to display information in a way that they may not be able to do. And being able to show them uh, information and look deep into a subject and present it and go, hey, look at this. This is really cool. A communication class and a speech class will be able to help you with that. Having a special teacher will help too. And being able to translate what the teacher says helps a lot too. Now, the downfall is that there's a lot of debate with communication books. The current one I have for our class is Communication for Success, which is a custom edition. It's a custom book for our school. The publisher, I believe, is Pearson. And I hate this book. I hate it so much. I'm looking at it right now, and I, I hate it so much. Um, because there are, so, it's very disorganized. It's actually very disorganized. And nobody knows how to properly read this thing and be able to properly give the, uh, I mean, the models make sense. The, the way they show how communication is broken down, I think that is absolutely fantastic. And they did a really great job showing that. Except the only other issue I have with this thing is that I'm trying to look for it. There is a line in here about stereotyping that I am not all too proud of, that I am reading from this book. And our teacher told us not to, you know, for the sake of the test, learn the answer that's in the book. But don't take it to heart for out there in the world. Because what happens is that you run into an issue of definition. I'm trying to skim through it and find it. If you can't hear me turning the pages, trying to find it. Um, I'm trying to look for the bold print, because I remember stereotype was actually a vocab word in this. I, I think I'm actually coming close to it. I'm in chapter two now. Um, but there's a lot of interesting things that you can learn from a, a communication book. Unfortunately, this one's custom made, so it's not like an official book you can get online. But there is an official book you can get. Um, usually if you look for like, if you go on like a website like Chegg, 
or anything like that to look for your school books and buy a book or two, it comes in very handy. Very, very handy when trying to learn about communication. I am not against a person with Asperger's buying a book. Um, here it is. Let me finish my thought first. Um, buying a book and learning about communication. I have no problem with that at all. I think it's really good for them to learn about people in society, even if they don't like it. But I'm not a fan of when parents and society and higher-ups think it's okay to just shove them in and just go, here you go, and just like kick them into a social situation because that can cause really bad um, retaliation. Anyway, in Chapter 2, Section 4, this book talks about stereotyping, and it ticks me off. Because what they talk about is what stereotyping is, and what it's what we do when we make assumptions about people based on their perceptions of certain groups and where they belong. Women, ethnicity, race, mental disabilities, etc. Stereotyping, like first impressions, can serve as a kind of first hunch about how to approach communication with a person of for a particular group. Uh, a stereotyping generally is a negative connotation. It, I can't believe they put this. This is the part, okay? There's a comma, and then there's this ending point. It does help order our lives, save time, and allow us to function in situations where we have limited information. However, stereotyping can cause real problems if we fail to realize that our perception is not reality, but our filtered views of reality. It can also cause us to forget that all people are unique. That is indeed the problem with this book, that it actually even mentioned the fact that it can be a helpful tool. I call bullcrap on that. Um, Seven billion of us, and there's a word called stereotype, and it's horrible. Especially in stereotyping in the terms of Asperger's syndrome. Stereotyping. Oh, your arms flap! Oh, you spin. Oh, you have a problem with communication. Oh, you're odd and awkward. If you stereotype Asperger's and autistic people, then you, my friend, are sad. <laughs> um, so I am a little disappointed in this book having that. However, there are a lot of interesting things in here that I actually really enjoy. Mindfulness. Um, to identify those moments when you may be swayed by one or more perceptual barriers dis um, that are discussed early in the chapter. Um, um, but being able to tell whether you are swayed by a person's perception. Um, and that's a good thing to know. But that might be something that a person with Asperger's may not have. Well, could they achieve it? Probably. There's probably a way you can um, gain that. But, again, with the whole instinct thing, how do you teach instinct? How do you teach knowing when it's okay to hunt? Instinct says that when you're lost... Uh, you instantly start searching for signs. That's instinct. It's instinct to start looking for a trail that you might have left behind. Maybe, in a metaphoric sense, a person like me, who has Asperger's, mind you, I, again, asterisk can't apply for everybody, but for me, maybe I don't have that instinct to know to do that. Does that mean I can't do it? No. It just means I have to remember to do it. It just means I have to book no, not morally no, book no. And there's two different forces of information you have to learn there. And when it comes to communicating, you start to learn and think, if I can teach this person to communicate, then maybe they can be cured. And that word is cringing to people. It is very, very cringing for people to hear the word cure. And, okay, I'm going to go ahead and just get this out of the way. There are people who think that autism needs cured. First off, I have no problem with them researching autism. I have no problem with that at all. If I want to see if they are gaining any progress in seeing what the cause of autism and Asperger's is. That is absolutely fine. I see no issues with this connotation. My problem is 
when suddenly those who have Asperger's need a cure. Like suddenly we're not okay. That's really odd. I just saw a picture on Tumblr. Really awkward one. Philip DeFranco. God, you look weird on that photo. Apparently an orc jizzed on his face. Ew. So. <laughs> Where did I lose my trail of thought? Oh, ADHD. I love you. With that cure word. I've seen so many people who are like, oh my gosh, she can communicate with people. She must be cured. Don't you dare get that confused with cure. Because the process in which for them to communicate, that method that they have to do in order to do it, never went away. And the worst part about those with Asperger's and autism is that they may have learned how to act a lot of them have this issue with not being able to say come up with this this instinctive way of communicating and knowing when to speak up which is another big problem I can't believe I didn't mention that some people who have a communication problem maybe it's knowing when to jump in when it's okay to jump in and for me that's a big problem especially on the phone I need those visual cues to know that I need to jump in. If I don't have those visual cues, I keep interrupting people on the phone. And for some reason, my mom just can't understand that. There's a big fight about my mom and me, but that's for another day. Anyway, so the instinct to know when to speak up and you're speaking up because you were taught to speak up are two totally different things. You as society, people who are neurotypical know when to jump in. You can't explain it, but you know. You know when it's okay to jump in. You understand, but I'll bet you money, not a lot, but a good amount, I'd probably say about 20, 30 bucks, at least, you can't put into words how you know not to interrupt somebody. And I'm not saying, like, while they're talking in mid-sentence. I mean, they're done talking for a second. You go to speak up, and then they talk. And then you feel like you've gotten interrupted, even though you barely even said a word. It's knowing when it's okay for when they're finished for you to jump in. Knowing that pause. You can't describe that into words. You can't put that into a continual thought. You can say all day, you wait a second or two, and if nobody says anything, jump in. But you can wait a second or two, and you both jump at the same time. What did you just solve? Nothing. So, you've learned how to act. You've learned how to pretend. You've learned how to fake. Does that mean you're cured of autism? No. Because you had to fake it. It wasn't instinctive. You never were cured of it. You just learned how to adapt to it. That's the difference. You're never cured of autism or Asperger's. You just adapt. You try your damn hardest to not let life overcome you and let these sensations that get overridden take over your life, but you can't help it. Sometimes your body acts on its own accord, and you can't do anything about it, and you're panicking because your body is acting on its own accord, or maybe because you're panicking because you don't know why you're panicking. Or maybe you just don't know how to communicate with people because you don't understand how to jump in. You don't know how to put words together. You don't know how to understand sentence structure. And nobody will listen to you. Because you're just the weird kid. And you're just the weird, stupid person who interrupts people and you're rude. Don't ever think for a moment that you're rude. It's okay to admit that you're doing something wrong. It's okay to admit that you need to have somebody show you what to do. I highly recommend therapy over medication any day. But when it comes to those of the outside world who want to look at Asperger's, we're looked down upon a lot. It's not fair, but it happens. In terms of communication, I highly recommend getting books. If you are a logic thinker, Think logically. Buy books. If you're a metaphorical thinker, 
think in terms and practice perception. I know that seems really difficult. Practice trying to put yourself in someone else's shoes. Play pretend if you have to. You know, I'm not asking you to go out and make a fucking speech tomorrow instead of in front of like 60,000 people. But at least give it a chance. You know, give it give it a chance. G- give yourself the opportunity to try and learn. I'm not asking you to go out every day and go to the mall and hang out with friends. I'm just asking you to learn the traits so that when you do talk to people, you don't come off as rude. Because you've learned it in a logical level and through a fake acting. I know that's not fair and you feel like you're being fake. And that's okay, I guess. You have to fake a little. Life's full of acting and it sucks. People fake all the time. People don't know how to be real anymore. And that's sad. But at least, if anything, we can still learn. There's nothing wrong with not learning a lot, but there's nothing wrong with learning either. Take a communications class. Go to a speech therapist. Go to somebody. Anybody. Don't just shut yourself off from the world. Give yourself a chance. Give yourself an opportunity to learn how to communicate with people. If somebody comes off as weird and you don't understand them, go to someone else. Get their opinion on it. Ask them, what what are they doing that's so odd about all this? Why can't I read them? What are they doing that's different? Don't be afraid to go to other people to help. It's okay. If they really love you, they won't bite your head off. And if they bite your head off, kick them in the ass. <laughs> kick them in the ass. Kick them so far your foot comes out of their mouth. Well, don't do that. You'll end up in potential jail. and Depending on your age, you'll go to juvenile court. But you get my idea. Don't let that get in your way. Try your hardest to understand a little bit of this complicating world. I'm not asking you to master it. I'm not asking you to go out and become president. I'm just asking you not to completely pull yourself away from the world either. I don't go out in the world. I'm in my room, or I'm at school, or I'm at work. That's it. I go to the bathroom to take a poop, and then I go to the kitchen to grab a bite to eat. And then I'm back in here, in my room. Doing podcasts and YouTube videos and Tumblr and Facebook and Twitter. But I'm not sad. I I still know how to go out there into the world because I still give myself opportunities. I say hi to people. I do. I give the opportunity to walk around and I'm over analytical. Unfortunately, my brain process says over analyze this and I can't turn it off because I've had to train for so long to overanalyze, and I can't shut it off. I can't. No matter how hard I try, I can't shut it off. My brain says, no. Overanalyze this. But that's that's what you gotta do. That's what you gotta do. I'm 50 minutes into this thing. I need to shut up. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't take too long to upload. 48 minutes. Wow. And soupy melted cookies and cream ice cream. Um... Regular commenter. I should not have made this an hour long. It explains why I'm so thirsty. And why I need to turn this off. (laughs) If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please no fashion tips. I won't listen to them. Then please do uh, leave me a message below. Give me your thoughts. Is this too long? This is what happens when I don't think about it. And I just turn on the mic. And this is what happens. Thank you all for listening. This is Megan reporting off for podcast number 7. It is now approximately 10.02. Hopefully this gets uploaded in an orderly fashion. In the meantime, I will talk to you all later. Um, if you guys have subjects you guys want me to talk about, I will gladly meditate on them and gather thoughts on them. And I will report back information. Lucky 7. You're an hour long podcast. How did I do this? Anyway, thank you for listening. This is Megan. Once again... For PRS Films, for podcast number seven, hopefully you all learned something about Asperger's in the term of my speaking, and hopefully you all will enjoy the next one. Till next time, peace out.